Well, today I'd like to direct your attention to the Gospel of Mark. Um, I've been having a kind of flow of consciousness uh, sermon series here as I reflect on our current events and things that are happening in the world around us and then think on them in the light of Scripture. Um, so I want to, for today, direct you to uh, Mark chapter 1. I, I want to pick up our reading at verse 14. Um, Mark chapter 1 which reads as follows in verse 14. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for the revelation it gives to us of your purposes and of your grace. And we pray that as we look to it this day, that your spirit would bless it to our hearts, that we would be equipped in faith, hope, and love to follow after you. Uh, bless our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I saw in the news this week reports of uh, the governor of California uh, extending uh, uh, restrictions on people going to the beaches. Uh, and a lot of people are very upset with that. Um, and some were protesting uh, these kinds of uh, restrictions on their liberties and their freedoms. So uh, the, there, there's uh, very much a, a great concern about these kinds of liberties that are being taken away from people even when they take sensible precautions. There's one story where one of the mayors there in California was upset that the governor had not talked to him about what was actually happening on the ground there at his beach. I think he was the mayor of Huntington uh, beach or something to that effect. Um, any, anyway, um, he, he complained and he said that you know there, there were camera shots and perhaps television reports of videos uh, looking at the beach and from the perspective of the camera it appeared that everybody was not observing social distancing but was all crowded together and mingling about and uh, putting themselves and uh, others at risk. But the mayor said, in fact, those images were a distortion of what actually was happening because the people were actually spread out quite a bit and they were uh, being very careful about um, maintaining that social distance between themselves. So um, governors tend to be acting uh, on their own uh, without uh, due uh, advice and consent. Uh, 
but uh, at the same time, uh, a number of states are beginning to open up their uh, in opening up their economies at different levels and stages. Uh, so there is a sense of uh, anticipation as to what our world is going to look like now in view of the uh, this experience that we've had with the coronavirus. How is our world going to change after this pandemic has swept across the world, including throughout the United States, and have, has had significant impact on our economy, on the way we do business, the way that we socialize together, uh, all kinds of things can be affected by this virus, and uh, so the, the risk is not only to health, but also to one's economy. So we are at a pivotal point in time, a significant moment in the history of, of our country, where we uh, arise from the pandemic and enter, if you will, into something of a new world, a new experience that is there before us. Uh, it's at this moment that as I go out into uh, the world to walk my dogs or take my parents out for a drive in this beautiful weather, uh, I'm reminded of the arrival of spring and a new world, if you will, coming down upon us. The warm sunshine, uh, the, the dew on the fields as the sun rises up over the horizon and uh, sh uh, flickers off of that, that uh, uh, grass. And uh, it's just a, a beautiful thing to uh, hear the birds, uh, particularly robins, chirping in the background. And it, it's a new day. There are new things before us, and I'm certainly looking forward to the church getting together and the new experience of fellowshipping once more uh, as God's people. With uh, the, the coming of Jesus Christ, Mark uh, intends, I think, to show us that this coming ushered in a new age, a new kingdom on the earth, a new uh, evidence of the work of God in history and time. And so uh, Mark uh, uh, talks about uh, the coming of Jesus Christ and his entrance into the world. Uh, he begins by uh, noting that Jesus uh, comes in the context of the arrest of John. John is arrested by Herod and uh, thrown into prison. And it's in that context now of judgment, of uh, plague uh, in terms of judicial action of, of the governor or the king in this particular case. Uh, it's that in that context that Jesus comes into Galilee, his home region, and proclaims the gospel of God, saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. And so in, in these words we see that Jesus has a sense that history is coming to a pivotal moment. Things are about to change in a dramatic and powerful way. Uh, Jesus uses the language of fulfillment. The time is fulfilled. History is ripe. You might recall the Apostle Paul in Galatians 4 talking about how uh, in the fullness of time God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem those who are under the law. There's a sense that there was a fullness of time and, and appropriateness to the arrival of Christ in human history at this moment in time. And so uh, Jesus uh, uh, notes the significance of this moment and he, he does that in the backdrop of Old Covenant prophecies and types. It's as though in, in his look at all of uh, Old Covenant history, everything leads up to this moment in time. And so he's probably thinking about the fulfillment of prophecies from the Old Covenant as arriving at this moment in time. In particular, uh, Daniel had his prophecy of the 70 weeks. And so here in Daniel's prophecy, you not only have a description of what God is going to do, but even when God is going to do it. There's a timetable set up for God's people to encourage them as they go through uh, one empire after the other, the Medo-Persian Empire, the uh, Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, and uh, Daniel gives them a, a timetable for when to expect the arrival of the kingdom of God in history. And it was at this particular time. In fact, there was a fellow by the name of Judas the Galilean uh, who went about talking about uh, the arrival of this great kingdom. And, uh, and he had in mind the idea of a 
political military kingdom, uh, of which he would be the head, uh, and uh, the uh, rising of Israel above its nations, the nations, and removing the yoke of Roman rule over them. Uh, but uh, Jesus shows us there, that there was a, a qualitatively different kingdom at work. It was the kingdom of God, uh, the spiritual reign of God over uh, his people. Now, how are we to consider the beginning of this kingdom? Is it something that is entirely new in human history? Well, I don't think that would be the, the right way to understand it. God had certainly been working among his people in generations and millennia back. From the time of Adam on, God had his people. He was working uh, through them. He ruled and reigned on the earth through his people. But it was a period of time in which God was ruling them through shadows and types, uh, through prophecies, through uh, various symbols that anticipated the fullness of time when all of these shadows and types would reach their fulfillment, when all these shadows and types would find reality. And so the prophecies were now being fulfilled in Jesus. He was the one who was to come, uh, who would uh, usher in the, the fullness of the kingdom of God as prophesied in the Old Covenant Scriptures. So uh, Jesus says, the time is fulfilled. This is that moment when the kingdom of God is at hand. And this kingdom is the rule of God, his dominion over uh, our lives, our hearts, and his uh, uh, subduing all of his enemies in the course of human history. Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. There's a sense of uh, the uh, significance of that kingdom when he says it's at hand. It, it's, it's right at the door. It is about to uh, break through human history. And you think about the sense of immediacy and, and the, the presence of this kingdom on earth. Um, you're reminded of what we considered uh, last week from Second Peter 3, where we talked about the coming of Christ at the end of history and how there seemed to be a delay in history. And Peter walked us through that, reminding us of the nature of God who is eternal, who is not subject to time, uh, and the eternal kingdom waiting in heaven to, uh, as it were, at any moment break into time. Uh, and then, to God being very patient and allowing history to unfold so that he might redeem his people until Christ should come for them at the end of history. Um, uh, here, Jesus says the kingdom is at hand. It's right among us. It is present in our midst. It has arrived. The, the kingdom is present in the presence of the king. And so, with the arrival of Jesus, uh, himself the king, we see the arrival of the kingdom of God on earth in a powerful way. This ushers in a huge moment in history. As I think of that, I, I think of the Old Covenant uh, anticipations of this. For example, in uh, the time of Noah, when the flood waters reside, and, or recede, rather, and as Noah finally steps out of that ark onto dry ground, and he looks before him, and he sees a new world. Everything is going to be different now. The judgment has come. The waves have died down. And now he's able to begin again, and he steps out into what would appear to be a whole new world. What a moment in history and time. You might think as well of Israel coming out of Egypt and God raising up finally after 450 years of captivity in Egypt, bondage and uh, harsh service there in Egypt, finally God brings Moses to lead Israel out of Egypt. And he brings them out after God sends plagues upon Pharaoh and Egypt and forces their hand to release his people. Mind you, you know, there's a lot of theological significance to this. It's a reminder that we do not save ourselves. We are saved by the mighty power of God setting us free. And so God rescued Israel from Egypt under Pharaoh. And you remember that as they left Egypt, they came up to the Red Sea. And so they had the Red Sea on one side, and they had Pharaoh, who had second thoughts about letting them go, Pharaoh and his armies coming down upon them in hot pursuit. And so they were caught in this vice between the Red Sea on the one hand and Pharaoh's armies on the other. Well, uh, 
They cried out to the Lord, and God instructed Moses to raise up his staff. The waters divided, you know the story, and the uh, wind blew on the, uh, the base of that sea and dried the, the, the ground underneath it. And then Israel was able to walk through that Red Sea on dry ground with dry feet and emerge on the other side of that uh, sea. Uh, of course, when Pharaoh saw that, he thought, well, why not us too? And they go rushing in, where angels fear to tread, as it were. And uh, he and his army uh, were then destroyed when God allowed the waters to come crashing down upon that army, and it wiped it out. Now, you are with Moses and Israel on the other side of the Red Sea. You've been delivered from Egypt. You've been delivered from Pharaoh and the immediacy of, of the wrath of Pharaoh and his armies. And now you have a new future before you, a new kingdom ahead of you. You are on your way to the land of Canaan. What an amazing moment. Everything is new. Things are different. There are changes at work uh, in a magnificent way. It, it's similarly when Jesus comes into world history and announces the arrival of the kingdom. This is entirely new. There is something great here. Uh, the, the promises are being fulfilled. The reality is far greater than what was anticipated in the past under shadows and types. And so there is an abundance of blessing being now poured upon the world with the coming of the kingdom. The, the, the Gospel of John puts it like this. Uh, the law was revealed under Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And it's a summary statement, one of those big uh, architectonic statements that overlap and, and look at the ages and says uh, uh, under Moses you had the law of God and that governed the people's lives and, and that was very much at the forefront of Israel's experience. Everything was about the Ten Commandments and all the precepts and the statutes and the ordinances that flowed out of the, that law and their relationship with God, with God was very much uh, stipulated by that law. It's not that there wasn't grace there. It's not that there wasn't uh, truth there. But the emphasis was on law under the Old Covenant. But in the New Covenant, with the arrival of Jesus, uh, there is a surpassing nature that has come to us. The law is still present, but now the accent is on grace. God's grace and truth, the realities of the kingdom of God, have now come upon us. And so we see... Uh, not only the obligation of the law before us, but the abundance of God's grace, and that we have a Savior who now has come to satisfy God's justice and to extend grace and forgiveness to us through his death on the cross. And so John sees this great transformation of human history from law and obligation uh, to uh, law satisfied and overwhelmed by grace and truth. Uh, Paul puts it like this, that where sin abounded, and of course uh, the law brought to us the knowledge of sin, it, 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 as it were, stimulated sin in our midst, where sin abounded, grace abounded all the more. And so with the arrival of the kingdom of God, we have a gracious kingdom uh, making its way into the world. And so we have a, a wonderful message that we bring to the nations of the earth. And it's a message that uh, focuses on Jesus Christ. Jesus says, it's uh, announcing the, the kingdom of God. And then he says, we are to repent and believe in the gospel. And so uh, we are appointed to uh, this kingdom of God. Now, it's the reign of God in earth, but think of how Mark begins this gospel at the very start of this, where he says that uh, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, you know, when you compare Mark's gospel with Matthew and Luke, you find that there are some interesting differences, uh, one of which is that Matthew and Luke give us genealogies about Jesus. Matthew begins with Abraham and goes through the generations through Moses and David and all the rest of them until he finally arrives at Jesus. Luke, on the other hand, starts with Jesus and he goes backwards in history and time until he finally comes to Adam, who he says, you know, 
uh, Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. And so uh, Luke brings us all the way back to the Garden of Eden and to Adam's relationship with God. Uh, in some ways this was an anticipation or a reflection on what Mark says here in the first verse where he says that this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, Mark, uh, I think, bears evidence of being uh, a, a gospel written under the influence of the Apostle Peter. And, uh, uh, you know, we recall Mark, also called John Mark, uh, comes up in a ver variety of times in the pages of Scripture, once where he is naked at the time of the resurrection, or the, the arrest, rather, of Jesus. Uh, he run runs away, he leaves his clothes behind and takes off. Uh, and then we ha find him uh, going with Paul and Barnabas on his missionary journeys, and then uh, Mark... Uh, uh, leaving that missionary journey, returning to Jerusalem, much to the displeasure of Paul, and eventually Barnabas and Paul have a, a split because of Mark. Uh, but it appears that Mark uh, came back to Jerusalem and spent a considerable amount of time not only with Barnabas but also with Peter, and uh, worked with Peter as well, perhaps in Rome for some period of time too. And uh, it, it seems to me that Mark was under that influence of Peter, and uh, you can see that in his writing style. Remember, Peter himself was something of an impetuous man. He was always the first one to say something for the disciples. He was always the first one to take action. Uh, he, he was ready to act. He was ready to speak. Uh, there was no delay for him. Everything was immediate. Well... When you look at this first gospel, you find, especially in this first chapter, everything is immediate. Everything moves rapidly. And so uh, when Mark begins the gospel, he doesn't go through the genealogy that Matthew and Luke went through, citing all the human ancestors of Jesus. He cuts to the chase, as it were. He goes to that which is most important. He goes to that which is vital. Jesus is the Son of God. And so he begins this gospel going right to the very start of things. It's much like what John does in his gospel when he says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, both of these gospels begin on this very high plane of revealing the transcendent glory of Jesus Christ. And Mark says he's the Son of God. Uh, not like we're all sons of God in a derivative sort of way or merely as creatures. He is uniquely the Son of God. He is the second member of the Trinity who has come into this world to save us. And so Mark takes us through this uh, first chapter and he, he talks about how immediately things happen. Time and time again you'll see it makes use of that word. Um, maybe I can highlight a couple uh, places for you. Uh, verse 10, he, Jesus came out of the water and immediately he saw the heavens being torn open, the Spirit descending on him like a dove. Verse 12, the Spirit immediately drove him out uh, into the wilderness. Uh, and, and then you can go on to the, the chapter. I, I don't have time to get into all of that, but um, see my video, that, which is airing now online. But um, you have this immediate action on the part of uh, Jesus as he's one who acts as the Son of God, who uh, makes things happen. And so, if you like adventure stories, if you like action stories, Mark's Gospel is very much an action story. There's dialogue, there is uh, thoughtful discourse in Mark's Gospel, but quite often there's a lot of action, uh, things happening. And he reveals here that this Jesus is the Son of God. So we begin with this high plane, and you see that as well as we go on in this first chapter, Jesus is baptized, he receives the Holy Spirit, he's filled with the Spirit. Uh, and, and then later on, as we read earlier, when Jesus is in Capernaum, uh, he heals the man who is afflicted with a, uh, an unclean spirit. And the Spirit says, I know who you are, you are uh, Jesus of Nazareth, the, the Holy One of God. So Jesus silences him, but what the demon said was true. This is the Holy One of God, set apart from all of humanity. This is the Son of God. And it is this one 
who has come into the world, who declares that we need to repent and believe in the gospel. Uh, this is the one who says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so when he announces that kingdom, he does so with uh, uh, absolute authority, with the authority of God himself. And uh, he commands us then to uh, repent. Uh, uh, William Hendrickson, commenting on this word repent, uh, says maybe it should be be converted, uh, as Hendrickson wants to emphasize there's a positive side to what Jesus has to say. In the Greek it's metanoia, which means a change of mind. Have a change of mind. And uh, in English we often translate that as repent. And the idea of repentance is not merely sorrow for sin and grief over what we have done, but it is a change of mind. It is a change of conduct and behavior such that we are no longer serving self and sin and Satan as children of Adam fallen in sin, but we abandon that and we yield our lives over to Jesus Christ now to serve Him. True repentance is a change. It's a turning away from the old way of life to a new way of life, to serving God. And that's what Jesus calls us to with the authority of the, uh, of the Son of God. As the Son of God, He commands that of us. So repent. And that needs to be the continuing message of the church. We don't just give a prosperity gospel or just merely an optimistic message about how everything will go well for you. Uh, we don't just give a social gospel and say, uh, God loves you just as you are. <clears throat> as you are. Uh, just come to us. No, there needs to be a change in heart and mind in attitude and in life. Uh, to turn away from the old way of thinking, behaving, putting all that aside and adopting new ways of thinking, new ways of uh, 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 obeying and serving. And that needs to be a part of our lives. So repent and believe in the gospel. And the gospel will unfold from here and John will explain that as time goes on. But he calls upon us to rest in the truth of God's provision of a Savior in Jesus Christ who has come to give us the gift, the free gift of everlasting life. And so as Jesus went out from here, he, he saw the disciples or men fishing and he calls them to come and follow me. I will make you fishers of men. That wasn't just a turn of phrase there to kind of lure them in, but it was uh, something that had great historic meaning in the Old Covenant, in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, you have images of God as a, a great fisherman. And it calls uh, others to come along with him to help him in the great work of fishing. But in the Old Testament is a, a, a message of judgment where God judges Israel and the nations like a fisherman dragging fish out of the water to their death. And uh, under the Old Covenant, the, the image of judgment and death is changed uh, in this New Covenant to a message of grace and salvation. And so uh, it, it does continue to have this idea of judgment and, and the, uh, the end of all things uh, and the need for salvation, but it, it focuses now on uh, the work of rescuing those who are lost, bringing them into the kingdom of God, and giving them a right, right relationship with God with everlasting peace and life. So. Uh, the gospel transforms everything and uh, makes everything new. So we walk into a new kingdom and a new age through Christ and his great work. And this is the great comfort and encouragement for the church. We have this new age. We have a covenant-keeping God who uh, has sent us a redeemer. And he calls us to be his disciples and to follow him. And you know how, how the text concluded... Uh, uh, with Jesus in the synagogue at Capernaum, uh, he heals the man demon-possessed, and he preaches to the people, and they make finally the observation, who is this man? Uh, he teaches as one with authority and not as the scribe. So there was uh, a, a, a clear difference between the way that Jesus spoke and the way the, the scribes spoke. The scribes quoted previous scholars and they said, we think this is what it should say, perhaps this is that, and so forth. They gave their surmises and their interpretations, but they weren't quite entirely sure and they didn't have full authority behind it. They just quoted other authorities. Jesus comes with full authority as the Son of God. 
qualitatively different. And he speaks with authority, even so much that the demons uh, obey him. Um, it, it's an amazing thing. Jesus speaks with great authority, and he commands us then to repent. And we who have repented, who have come into this kingdom, have enjoyed the outpouring of the Spirit in our lives and the powers of the new age to come, uh, we are continually being transformed into Christ's image. We are now to become fishers of men. We are being trained by Christ to reach out to others and to bring them to a saving knowledge of Christ. And our message is much the same. Repent and believe in the gospel, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, we live in a great moment in history. Everything has changed because of Christ's arrival in the world. And we speak with the authority of Christ when we call people to that repentance and new life. Well, there's so much more to say about this text. Um, I'll refer you to uh, the sermon that I preached on this yesterday. It's recorded and it's online. It should be online now, so you can see it. You can see it at our website as well, and it'll go into a little bit more detail for you. Uh, let's pray for a moment. Father, we thank you for our time together today and pray that your Spirit would bless this meditation on your Word that you would strengthen our hearts, that we would look at our world today differently. It's not really something that is moved by uh, historic impulses of nations and peoples and politics and armies. Help us, O oh Lord, to see the glorious impact of the kingdom of Christ, and the powers of the age to come that are at work in the world, uh, a kingdom that uh, does battle with the forces of evil and, and the powers of darkness and even overcomes them. We pray for your blessing on us that we would go forth from this place uh, with renewed minds and hearts, uh, refreshed by a vision of the kingdom of God that, and its arrival in our world. And we pray that you would encourage us to go out into the world to your glory and praise. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.